What are the thoughts of the group here? We've got Anthony Chang writing that Jimmy Butler's MRI is scheduled for 3.30 today for those wondering. And Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald is coming after Shams by saying one national insider wants to jump ahead on the story because that's what they try to do and could ultimately end up right if the MRI, if, if, if the MRI breaks in the writer's favor. But the beat writers are on top of it. While there's obvious concern, there's no MRI yet and thus no diagnosis yet. Wow. I love Spicy Barry. Just taking people out, man. That's why Barry made it to the Elite Eight of the Heat Twitter yeah. bracket that Chris Cody showed me today. That did not have Mike Ryan on it, curiously, despite the fact that he told us yesterday he invented Heat Twitter. Got a lot of messages from people saying Mike Ryan has nothing to do with Heat Twitter. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. He said what? He, he claimed to basically invent Heat Twitter and also me. I think he invented saying Heat in 5, too. No, that was me. Yeah. Again, though, Barry Jackson is writing and could ultimately end up right if the MRI breaks in the writer's favor. So now you've got the visual image of Shams being like, yes, <laughs> I need this injury to be real. Um, I don't think that Shams. He's going to Jeff Galuli, Jimmy Butler, so that it's real. Do we think that Shams uh, gets is a guessing. lot of this stuff wrong <laughs> and is guessing? Like, I don't know. This stuff seems, this particular one where you're reporting something before and most of this information comes from agents okay i will i don't know if this particular one does but the 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 insiders traffic a great deal in the information provided by sports agents which is often very good but on an injury i don't very often have someone like shams being so eager to get ahead that he gets it wrong in fairness to shams he said he is his report was he's getting an mri the speculation is he'll be out for a few weeks and that's, that's how you do it yeah. like that's how you you do it if you're on the side where you're trying to get there first is you can kind of hedge with the expectation and it's feared to be and all of those things that come that doesn't mean that he'll be wrong and he might very well have the information uh, but I can understand why the local writers who were getting information probably directly from the team about hey this is when this is all scheduled for so it hasn't been done yet would be saying that's a bit jumping the gun <laughs> if Barry's mad for shams being reckless he would have been mad at me after seeing the replay being like he's fine he just banged knees. <laughs> do you guys do that ever with injuries like that? Because I always – with these okay. with basketball okay. players, yeah. there are times where they, they – not sell stuff, but just, you know, Dwayne Wade was – he would lay – he would go down oh, yeah. and he'd lay there for like five minutes and everyone would be terrified and he'd pop right back up and be fine. Both so, Mike Schur and Mike Ryan last night were texting about how Jimmy was faking the that's whole That's what thing. I mean. So you have to like – you always do that as a fan of like you, you're being a doctor. And in the replay, you see the knees bang. So there was no clear like – you know I mean, what I mean? He fell on yeah, him. so you're just like, oh, it's just a bang injury. He's fine. And I, and then he's not, so I feel bad. Because I, I was right away, I was like, he's fine. Don't worry about this. I don't ever do stuff like that because I don't understand how Giannis won the championship the year that he won the championship because my immediate diagnosis from his reaction was he's broken and might not ever play again. Like, that... That is not going to be able to come back in a couple of days. I don't know why you would bother doing that, except you just want your hope to, not, it is, to not ruin yes. the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Did it last night with my bull playing with my bulls and Alex Caruso, which, wow. by the way, another bull nice. on bull injury happening after last week's dunk situation and Andre Drummond twisted his ankle. Last night, Andre Drummond ran into Alex Caruso. Caruso would have probably been the person to guard Jimmy Butler in the play-in game tomorrow night. Now both of them are probably going to be out. What a disaster. That's a win for the Bulls, though. Drummond I mean, needs to be stopped, by the way. What's happening here? That's good we analysis. need to investigate him. <laughs> What's happening? Even though Caruso is an excellent perimeter defender. He's yeah. great. Um, it's very sad. Yeah, but Stugatz just out there. Stugatz <laughs> wanted to give you some form of analysis. You have to understand, every sentence that is placed in front of Stugatz is something where he has to have a take on. And so his take there is that yeah. Jimmy Butler is better than Alex Caruso. Yeah. A winning take for Stugatz. <laughs> Indisputably so. So since you like to have takes on these things, yeah. uh, on yesterday's show, I began with something that we didn't uh, chew on much after that, which is Kendrick Perkins accused Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley of, on the Michael K show, 
not watching Knicks games at all. He's saying it's obvious they're not watching the Knicks. The only time they're watching the Knicks is when it's on the TNT game of the week. And I will tell you, Stu Gatz, uh, that I don't think a lot of people know what I'm about to say, which is the single most successful and popular sports studio show in the history of sports studio shows. The generation of players who are Kendrick Perkins are really tired of Barkley and Shaq from on high having all of the weight and power of opinions to batter today's game even though it's the most popular sports studio show of all time we're going to talk to Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson about that because I believe a lot of people I've heard a lot of players their age who are eager for the sport to be analyzed by others as opposed to the ones who have had the most power earned the most power for the longest time it's their job to give opinions on the games they're watching, on the topics within the NBA, and on the state of the game today as compared to, you know, when it was or what it was when they played. So I have no issue with those guys well, the having— first, The first sentence you said is important. It's their job. It's their job. The games they're watching. The part that you said that's important okay. is— Okay. Well, well, wait. No, Dan, we've had people, myself included, by the way, comment on games they'd never watched well, yeah, a second and, and, of. No, and Sugat, you— Throughout the history of Sugat, time, Dan. You want—you always want people to have the rights that— you yourself want to have. You always fall on the side of why shouldn't they be allowed to not watch the games? And I would argue that in the case of those two guys, they're there to be Shaq and Barkley. They're, you're not paying them necessarily to watch the games. You're paying them to be Shaq and Bar Barkley. But the job tends to be watch the games. Kendrick Perkins has to watch the games. Like you saying, ah, I comment on that. People are getting awfully pissed off rightly that have been around women's basketball for a long time because right. a whole lot of people are getting here now and the only way we can talk about it is ratings and interest and stuff because we haven't been watching the games and the people who have watched the games expect the people who are paid to analyze it to show it the same kind of respect it's in how it is that they talk about it. It's not an unfair criticism. Kendrick Perkins, you can say here, is going to end up on the losing side of this argument because of how good Shaq and Barkley are and that show is at being Shaq and Barkley. But his criticism can also be valid inside of that. There aren't many people who get away with giving analysis on television that's the most powerful platform that can be accused credibly of not watching the games. That platform is powerful because of Charles Barkley because of Kenny Smith, and because of Ernie Johnson. They built that thing. They provided themselves with the biggest platform uh, in the sport. But what is Kendrick Perkins doing? Like, I have no idea if he's watched every Nick game. What, is he taking attendance? Like, honestly. Oh, no, but Stugatz, uh, there are a couple of things here. One, it's often obvious in the analysis. And two, Shaq and Barkley are really busy with lives, with giant lives that might not have them at 60 years old, in Barkley's case, uh, devouring NBA League Pass on a, on a Tuesday night that he's not working. But you need to watch every single Nick game to come up with the opinion that, hey, Boston's better. The Knicks aren't going to go far in the playoffs. They're without Julius Randle. You don't need to watch every Nick game to say Stugatz. that. That's ludicrous, okay. Dan. No, it's not that, Stugatz. It's that you expect a level of expertise from the people who are analyzing the games you care about. And when the discussion points by the generalists are often who's the pressure on more as opposed who's the, who's pressure? the pressure on as opposed to the technical aspects right of of the sport that make the Knicks fans around here furious because they say it's obvious in Stephen A. Smith's analysis that he's he's being a Knicks fan publicly, but that he's not watching as many of the games as they are. Like I don't blame people who are listening to analysis that they think is bad or against their team, demanding that that analysis be informed by facts, research, expertise, or at the bare minimum, can you care enough to watch the games? I don't think, I don't think that's an unreasonable criticism. Yeah, I mean, Kendrick Perkins feels about these guys the way I feel about Mike Ryan. 
Like he comes in here and acts like he knows things about the Heat, but he doesn't watch any of the games. Right. So how can you possibly take that analysis seriously, including the people, prominent people on Heat Twitter who reached out yesterday and said, in 14 years, I've never once associated Mike Ryan with Heat Twitter. Hmm. Um, he invented Heat Twitter. But Dan, may I quickly just suggest we hear from someone who has been watching a every lot of the game, Nick yeah. games. In fact, every Nick game. Sub 500 seasons, it's been lonely. Now the best player is on our side. <laughs> been losing and losing for much too long. But now we're back with New York pride. Jalen. You've got us on our feet, Jalen. We're going to win the East, Jalen. Without Randall, we're still doing fine. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Nailed it, man. So bad. Could be a song about Jeremy Lin, too. We don't know. Fine. It sounds like Hotline to the End Zone, how bad that was. <laughs> That means you're going to have to find Heartline to the end zone. That's uh, exactly why I brought it up. Chris Cody. Uh, <laughs> let's get for the group here. I, uh, I talked about this briefly the other day because the Rays have a uh, reliever, Stugatz, Pete Fairbanks. Uh, this is another one of those human beings in baseball who throws 102 miles an hour and blows <laughs> saves, and I don't understand how anyone ever makes contact on him. Everyone has one of these in their bullpen now. But uh, Pete Fairbanks uh, was complaining the other day about slippery balls, so I don't know. Hey, yo. I don't know whether Crazy. this is that clip, uh, which blown save he's reacting to. This one looks like the one that I saw a week ago. So let's uh, let's hear what he had to say. He wanted the writer to put in capital letters and underline something. Pete, just can you kind of run through what was going on in the ninth inning? It looked like maybe you didn't like some of the balls that were coming in. Yeah, they were horrible. You mark that down, all caps for me. Horrible. Uh, no excuse, though. Didn't throw strikes, and that's what happens when you don't throw strikes. You get punished for it. So I'd love to see those come out of the humidor tomorrow in a little better shape before they get rubbed up. But, uh, you know, that's nobody to blame but myself for not being able to adjust to some of the, the quality issues dry or, or not smooth or what was the uh, issue there was uh, just overall bad uh, i'm not going to elaborate further than that they were not uniform from ball to ball so there's no i mean dry smooth whatever you want to say just non-uniform didn't feel right it just make it tough for you to grip and kind of get the ball where you want it to go uh yeah it's tough to throw your slider when the ball goes that way out of your hand so he wears his hat poorly <laughs> it's hard to wear a hat like that. What are you shaking your head? No, like that's it? a good move. That's when you've had your hat on for a long time. You actually take it off the back and just kind of sit it on top like you that for relaxing it. Yeah, it. yeah. yeah no, that's that's yeah. a vet move right there. Yeah, yeah, let your head breathe. He has a booger. So does Clooney. <laughs> Let's play the other sound from Fairbanks. I guess this is from last night. Was it just a matter of command, location, selection, anything specific? No, I thought it generally sucked. I didn't think it was a specific <laughs> suck. I thought it was like an all-encompassing type of suck. So, you know, we're going to try and rectify that. But for right now, I'm going to be pretty pissed about it. <laughs> That's great. All Where has this suck. guy been? All around suck. Uh, I, uh, Tony, if you saw him pitch, like it's all elbows and teeth, and then something gets spit out at 102 miles an hour. It's, that gets hit. It's just, yes, and then, that somehow doesn't have the command that it needs to. And I'm always expecting at the end of race games, well, this will be three guys easily out because, again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a consortium. It's a syndicate of elbows and knees. And what gets belched out from the elbows and knees and teeth is 102 miles an hour. He doesn't have a full windup. He's got like a football throw. <laughs> let's uh, let's play for that again. All for those of you that aren't watching and are just doing this with audio. That pause is coming from a man who has a pompadour of red hair that's uh, disheveled in a way that suggests he's given up three runs and three hits in one inning. Uh, <laughs> like Conan O'Brien. Yes, and and that pause is him thinking about how to answer this before giving the perfect answer. Was it just a matter of command, location, selection, anything specific? Uh, no, I thought it 
thought it generally sucked. I didn't think it was a specific suck. I thought it was like an all-encompassing type of suck. So, you know, we're going to try and rectify that. But for right now, I'm going to be pretty pissed about it. That's right. It's time for Thursday Thunder, and it is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Tony. All right. This parlay was cooked up by the one and only Juju Gotti for our Thursday Thunder. We will start on the diamond. Yeah, I know you love baseball. We got the San Francisco Giants against the Arizona Diamondbacks tonight. 945 first pitch. We're going to take the Giants on the money line. Who's pitching? Are they a favorite? Great question. Dog? I don't know. Oh, come on, man. No, no, no. It's I'm Juju's. saying I don't know. I don't know who I don't know who it is, but Juju does, which is why he picked the San Francisco Giants. Not only that, what? we're gonna we're gonna sprinkle in a little something else. I know it's a pitcher's duel though. You know how I know that? Because he took the under. Second leg of our parlay under half a run for the first inning. Pitcher's duel. We have Logan Webb versus Ryan Nelson. Logan oh, Webb wow. pitching for the Giants. Pitcher's duel. Logan Webb is nasty. Told you that. Told you that. Mm-hmm. I hate betting unders. I know. <laughs> the worst. It's just the first inning, though. We'll You're rooting for nothing under. to happen, though. Well, the, the, re- <laughs> the reason, and I know that the numbers get a little bit inflated because most people don't like betting unders, but you do understand why it is that the under is so unappetizing when if there's a lot of scoring early, you're doomed. But if you're betting the over and there is no scoring early, you can still have a comeback late. Whereas with an under, you can be done in the fourth <laughs> inning and your bet's over. But uh, I hear you, Dan. But any time, any time I take an over, it is one nothing in the seventh. <laughs> it's also like if nothing happens, then it's a little treat. It's like, oh, well, I watched it and it was boring, but I, I won. Yeah, yeah. All right, last leg of the parlay. We are going to hoops. We got the Sacramento Kings against the New Orleans Pelicans. No Zion, by the way. Mm. So who's got to step up? Herbert Jones. We're going to take him over 11 and a half points. Put it on the poll, please, at Levitard Show. Every time you bet the over, is it one nothing in the seventh inning? <laughs> at Levitard Show. Also, some people are reacting now uh, to our uh, heat analysis so far, and some people are getting upset and writing in to us. No one deserves blame for the heat loss last night. This is insane. <laughs> really? What you are you idiot? talking about? You fool! <laughs> no, so no blame. Everybody's going to talk. Okay, this is sports radio. I mean, it's an all-encompassing suck. You don't understand. You don't understand. What do you mean no one gets blamed? I'm what are we going to do? Come in here and just steal each other's cupcakes? Like, look at each other and not say anything? This goes against everything I stand for. <laughs> no, Dan, that's my, my favorite criticism of the show sometimes is when people are like, they're, they're wrong about this. The actual reality is this very neutral opinion. And I'm like, yeah, yeah but that'd be a pretty boring show. That's why you do what you do, and we do what we do. Exactly. Whoa, <laughs> dork. I do, dork. Think, I do think it is fair to say this part. If the star players are both on both teams are injured, you're going on the road to try and win a road playoff game. Your second best player is in foul trouble. That's a hard game to win against a team that's won eight in a row and is probably the second most talented team in the or the third most talented team in the East. That is fair, but when you don't win the game, you blame someone. I mean, Without your starting backcourt and leaning on a guy who came back like six games ago. Well, you blame somebody if you're the Miami microphones and you're frustrated by what happened. But if you're Philadelphia, which was booing in the first quarter, and mm-hmm. again in the third when Tobias Harris missed a shot. Right. Late in the third, I think, they were booing Tobias Harris. Uh, When you're Philadelphia, it is, you mentioned it earlier in the show here, I know Joel Embiid gets a lot of credit for always being injured. I know Joel Embiid gets a lot of I'm sorry, a lot of blame for always being injured. He gets a lot of blame for always being eliminated early when he's out there trying to play in a mask and he's not himself. But at the end of that game, there were two players that were clearly injured, and one of them was more injured. He's going in for an MRI today. 
but he was less effective than the other one who was injured. And if you're in Philadelphia and you're a haunted franchise that's been dysfunctional for a while, you and had Ben Simmons and that ordeal, you can look at what Joel Embiid did and said, huh, nobody deserves blame here. Perhaps I'd like to give him some credit that at the end of the game, he ended up winning the game because the offense was moving through him. He was limited, and he made both the shots, the free throws, and the passes to control the end of that game. What is this credit thing you speak of? What are you talking – and in Philadelphia? (laughs) Oh, especially in Philadelphia. Get out of here. (laughs) We all know it was the chicken. Philadelphia ends up putting itself in a position – to break the heart of New York and have the easier path when they've got the injured superstar than the one they would have against Boston. Uh, No doubt. But as a Knicks fan, I can tell you, I wanted Philadelphia. I didn't want the Heat. I want Embiid. I want him a little banged up. I don't like Tobias Harris. I think the Knicks win that one in five. Hmm. Knicks in five? Coming from the maker of Tiger Woods will win the Masters. That was a flyer, Dan. (laughs) look at this liberal woke turd out here doing charitable things for other people he's he's in the middle stugats of his annual charity bowl and Mm -hmm. he is uh doing something not everyone is doing in that every donation goes to help new american pathways and what i'm about to tell you it's a refugee resettlement organization in atlanta edsbscharitybowl.com is where you go uh, and it's real easy, actually. Our audience is very good about this. Just text the word Charity Bowl 24. Charity Bowl and the number 24. Uh, it Make it one word uh, to the number 91999. Our audience is very good about supporting uh, the causes around here. I think I've made that too complicated. Charity Bowl 24. I just called 911. Uh, Charity Bowl 24. That's one word. One word yes. Uh, the text number is 91999. Text yes. Charity Bowl 24 to 91999. But, That's three nines. I have a lot to get to with Spencer. Well, four, technically. Uh, but there's a one after the first one. Yes. Uh, all of this, do I have to put one before the number? All of this can be easier, I the think. The plus. Uh, but uh, why are you doing this, Spencer? Just explain the cause, please. Uh, it is to support refugee resettlement here in Atlanta. If you don't know, the refugees we take in as part of our agreements with our international partners, they end up in American towns and cities. And there are agencies there that are helping them become successful new Americans and get them off to a better start in their new home, our great country, this land, the United States. And Atlanta is one of them. I used to work in that community and uh, long ago in a former career that I was not very good at. So this is kind of my way of uh, my apologia of just point people to this and say, please give them money, which they have for the better part of over a decade. So it's like charity bowl. Is like a bowl game? What are we doing with the bowl? Is there anything? Okay. So glad you asked that. You guys are doing this better than I do it. Okay. An effective oiled charity fundraising machine the Levitard show. Um, What you're going to do is you're going to give an important number, a number that means something to you in terms of your team, uh, particularly in terms of a rivalry. One of my favorites is to donate, uh, you know, 5224 or 5220, which is the uh, score from the 1997 Sugar Bowl when Florida blew out Florida State. Yeah, I got to go a long way back to find a happy number for Florida football, but I do it anyway. Uh, might give two thousand and eight dollars this week in honor of our last ancient national title. I'll dust it off for this week. That's happy. You pick a number that matters to your team, and that is what you donate. Post it publicly, rub someone else's nose in it, and then hopefully they respond in kind. You should go for some smaller numbers. You know, I mean, just it, you know what? That is a valid point. Thank it you. could be twenty oh eight. It could be. Listen, you could do a number like I'd like. You could do. You could even do a middling receivers numbers. If you got a guy who's got like 438 yards, a four dollar and thirty eight <laughs> yard donation is as welcome as a four hundred. You're basically one. You're, you're saying make sports <laughs> jokes and razz your friends and speak the language of sports intimacy, where you insult your friends and you do a nice thing for a good cause. EDSBSCharityBull.com, or you just type in the numbers, Stugatz. It's easy nine one 
nine nine nine, and you text the word one word charity yep. bowl and the number twenty four. Yes. Uh, that could all be easier, Spencer, but thank you for the work that you're doing. I want to explain uh, to the audience here, uh, because we did this earlier in the week, and I want to bring it to you. Uh, I want you to tell me what you think this sound is that we're about to play for you. All right. <laughs> Going to get it one more time. <laughs> uh. That that sounds like a goat being shot into space. <laughs> He's right. Yeah, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with goat astronaut. It is Mike Tyson sprinting. <laughs> I thought it was Sue God saying superfluous. <laughs> superfluous. I, Dan, what was the last time you sprinted? Like like you're you're over you're over fifty now. I am fifty five. I'm gonna say I sprinted. Two years ago. Okay. It didn't feel good, did it? No, it did not. No. Yeah. Sprinting on the beach, but I did not make that noise. And you would have. Well, some, you, If you've been going as hard as Mike, yeah, you're going to make a weird noise. Somebody's writing in here, I was walking down a long, dark hallway, and Lebetard show played the Mike Tyson running sound out of nowhere. I had a heart attack. <laughs> Can you... I'm a uh, by the way, bold move making fun of Mike Tyson for anything. If that if I if I don't know for sure that that man isn't behind me, I'm on camera and I still don't trust it. I'm not saying a damn thing about that man. It's hard. Not word to, one. It's hard to explain. I think an entire generation of people are going to arrive at a 57 year old Mike Tyson, see something sad there instead of what you and I see there, which is someone to be feared throughout eternity, forever, absolutely forever. If you want to look up the craziest thing in the world. Go on YouTube and and search Mike Tyson versus Mitch Blood Green. That's right, a boxer named Mitch Blood Green, who was at one point, I believe, an actual street gang leader. And it's scary because Mike doesn't knock him out. Mike just beats him up, and it's worse than a lot of his knockouts because by the third or fourth round, you're like, I just wish this man would go down for his own safety and his own good because he eats some of the worst shots you will ever hear. I didn't say see. I said hear. They're horrifying. I believe that he fought Mitch Blood Green outside of a haberdashery at 4 a.m. in Harlem. <laughs> he did. It he was jumped out of a limo that Walter Berry was in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Two-part fight. Two-part fight. Once in the ring, once in the street. Yeah. But he's 57. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't care. He could be 75. <laughs> Reverse it. That man's that man is that man's gonna whoop my butt at any age. He, yeah. He, make whatever noises you want. Okay. I, I don't care. I can't believe I can't believe that man is going to lose to a Paul brother because there's no way there's no way this fights will be up and up. There's absolutely no way. And not if he loses. Correct. Take a dive? If, no, if Tyson loses, it is all fixed. I can't. I can't see. Have you seen the sparring videos? That's I know. reckless. I, a lot of people are formulating their takes based off of what they've seen Mike Tyson do and these most recent sparring videos. But I can mm -hmm. assure you the odds makers have kind of investigated this one. And there's a reason why Jake Paul is minus 500. <laughs> He's minus rigged. 500. Yeah. And you're out here saying microphones that Mike Tyson's going to kill him. <laughs> him is a are minus 500 favorite. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's all mythology fear, and it's me ignoring and Spencer ignoring 57. <laughs> that's a big difference. 57 versus a dude that's in his 20s in his athletic prime. He bit a man's ear off. That man is not Mike Tyson. <laughs> that man is not Mike Tyson. I don't care. I, 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 I watched that man take people's heads off as a child. It does not matter. I am going to uh, start a fight in here by pointing out to Spencer Hall that according to tax documents obtained by USA Today, Miami paid out $22.7 million in total compensation to Mario Cristobal in 2022, the largest single-year payment to an athletics employee at any private university ever on record. $5 million per win. Yeah, $5 million a win. I hope that they made that an ACH deposit and not a check because with his clock management skills, he's never getting to the bank on time. It's just, just going to sit there. He's hey. too busy in the um, portal. 
<laughs> yeah. Hey. It, it should be it should be noted that uh, that includes the buyout and taxes, and the key phrase there is private institution because mm-hmm. what Miami is doing right now is actually spending as the public schools do, because I guarantee you, if you were to compare that to some of the compensation in the public schools, it doesn't make quite the aggregate easy story that it's become. Yeah, no, I'm citing the rumor, by the way, that Miami is a public institution. We're just going to call it that just to infuriate them on top of everything else. I'll be like, well, it's part of the Florida University's, you know, it's the stated system. Come on. Uh, yeah, Mario Cristobal, by the way, perfect example they need to keep him on for like 10 years because they will get an, a national title accidentally right they will kirby smart this they will just say you might be smarter than us you might coach better but eventually i will stack them so high that we can't fail oh. all right and, and you're honestly, not the god's ears pal <laughs> all right that's that's it just don't fire your guy okay like say whatever you want. I don't care if, if Mario's listening. Okay, you may not be the brightest bulb. Okay, but if you stay on long enough, you're going to draw enough moths. That's how it's going to work. Okay, that's the plan, recruit. bud. That <laughs> is recruit, the plan. Recruit, become too big to fail. That's it. Honestly, you want to know what Michigan did? Like Michigan just kept Harbaugh on. They could have fired him. They could have gone for the next shiny thing. But that man said, "I'm going to recruit 310 pound linemen who are mean as hell, and one day we're going to bust through that wall." We might only do it once, and then I'll jump ship and go take the Chargers job. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to do it. That's what Miami should do. That's my approach with Florida. Florida, are we good right now? No. Do I think Billy Napier is a good coach? No. Is he recruiting pretty well? Yeah. How long am I willing to stick with it? I don't know. How long have I got? I'm probably going to be alive for another 25 years. It, it'll happen eventually. Just keep him on. Any thoughts, because your music commentary is usually pretty high-end, any thoughts, I don't know whether you enter the fray on rap beef or not, whether you feel comfortable (laughs) in your position to talk about most recent hip-hop beef, or you want to sit that out? Uh, No, no, no. I'm messy, so I'll enter the fray. Um, First of all, Drake is boring. Drake has always been boring. Drake lives and dies off his producers. Drake has never said an interesting thing. Quote me a Drake bar that matters. Not one. Not at all. Oh, that's interesting. You have trust issues with women. Oh, wow. You did it all yourself. That's every Drake song. I did it all for my team, and I hate women. That's it. That, that's it. his entire like oeuvre. His entire work, his body of work is just that. I don't find him interesting. Do you want to say he can rap? I Yeah, he can rap. Do I find the character of Drake interesting? Not at all. Does he have good production? Yes. I hope he pays them a lot because they're the reason he's successful. I will never be interested in a Drake like rap beef, ever. Ever, because he's lost it from step one, because I don't find him compelling. Is it hilarious that he's currently getting dragged by Rick Ross, a noted fabulist and liar, even on the rap curve of I am lying about the things I am saying about? Yeah, it's awesome. Will it matter? No, no. The kids love Drake. The kids absolutely love Drake. They will buy whatever he puts out. So none of this will matter, and none of this will be a better diss track than Pusha T's on Drake. None. No, Pusha T, Pusha T ended that for me. I do not know if you can ever construct a better diss track than the one. But for everybody, everyone says that was the end of all of it, that none of those guys can come back from that. But Kendrick Lamar is somebody that I think is universally regarded as everyone loves good writing. But not everyone loves good writing. Don't like I, I will tell you this. Uh, the teens, the Preach. teens do not care about in their in what I have been heard, what I've been told uh, by both my son and his peers. We don't care for those old wordy rappers. OK, they like that's it. We don't care about them words, which I respect deeply as somebody who kind of is like lyrics are overrated. Like I'm convinced an entire generation of baby boomers and lead poisoning really led to them thinking Bob Dylan was smart. Yeah, I don't care about words. I don't care about words at all. Okay, it's vibes. It's they want vibe based rappers. Preach. It's yes. vibes. I saw Lil Uzi, uh, Lil Uzi perform at Coachella, and he said like seven words the entire time to his own music. Yeah. It's just vibes. It's just listen. They just they just want a good vibe. Does it go? And I respect that honestly, right? Like I am a Kendrick Lamar fan. I like Kendrick Lamar. But if you come to me and go, yeah, but did you listen to his words? I'm like, ah, like half the time maybe. It's got to have a good beat. It's got to sound good of my car. It's kind of going to either want to make me fight or cry. 
And then if it doesn't do either of those, I'm not real interested. Does he want to sit it out? It's his wheelhouse, man. <laughs> Are your thoughts that J. Cole shouldn't have sat it out? That he, I J. Thought- Cole should always sit it out. J. Cole can sit it out for the next decade. I, I, I am joining uh, I am joining fellow sports writer Shea Serrano in the J. Cole and Salmonex. That's a great way to go to sleep. You got nothing for him, Tony? It just sounds like a hater, respectfully. Yeah. <laughs> Having well an opinion, yeah. an informed of, opinion. Of hating everybody because... is not an opinion, though. Spencer's not like, I don't everybody. like this guy. I he sucks. My... This I like guy Kendrick sucks. Lamar. I go to sleep to this guy. I like Pusha T. I do not care for J. Cole. This is having a stance. If you invoke the word hater, by the way, you've automatically lost because we're no longer arguing on the merits. I've been shuffled into a bin, a category, as you, opposed you to saying. You sound like a Drake hater. I am 100% a Drake okay. hater. Okay. That's fine. Traitor. I do not like him. You brought I do the not haters, find not him. Com- I do not find him compelling. In the li- what is compelling about Drake? Find me one thing that is compelling about Drake. What oh. story has he told? What beat is immortal? What bar would you drop and go? Ooh, that's hard. Ooh, that's good. Nothing. I just flipped the switch. Flip. flip. Ooh. No, no one's just ever said that. No, he just ever done flitch. that. <laughs> Ah, I misspoke. Drop he ring. misspoke. He slipped the switch. <laughs> Damn it. That's a harder. That's a harder line than any Drake line. <laughs> Thank you. Give him credit. He came out and did better writing than Drake or any of his ghostwriters. <laughs> slip, slip. Again, I, I will tell you, edsbscharitybowl.com is where you go, and you can just text as one Damn word. It. One word. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts, doesn't it? Charity Jeff Bowl Green. 24 to the number 91999. Is that one word? I wasn't clear. Uh, it is one oh. word. Charity Bowl and the number 24, all one word. And one more thing, uh, just so that people understand, Spencer, because you are somebody who's doing work here that not everybody is doing, and our audience usually does pretty strong in these areas when they believe in the humanity of a cause why is this the heartfelt one for you because you said you worked with these people and i'm guessing somewhere in there you saw where help was needed absolutely it's one of those things where um these are people who have been through a lot a tremendous amount this country is a country of immigrants and i think one of the most important tenets across any kind of uh ethos religion or belief system is hospitality towards a stranger That's it. That the first thing that you should say to them is welcome and you should mean it and that we should help people who are here because we have the resources to do that. Even if your resources are, by your own estimations, meager, that any amount of help uh, or even volunteer work in your community makes an immense difference, particularly when everyone does it at once. He's a liberal woke hater. He is Spencer <laughs> Hall, everybody. Thank you. You can uh, also support. It's one of the best podcasts going anywhere. Co-host of Shutdown Fullcast. It is, uh, I don't know which one he likes most, the the football of Saturdays or the funny that Saturday produces. If you can only have one, you only get to choose one for the rest of your life. Uh, the content that Saturday produces or the games that they produce, which one do you get to, which one do you choose? Love of football or the love of football, a love of funny that Saturdays provide? Um, I will always take the football. I will always take the football because uh, without that, there's not much to it. Uh, he loves it so much, Stugatz. And he's doing it the old-fashioned way. So few people out there just love writing about the South and history through football. What a ridiculous path he has taken to caring about this dumb, dumb thing we do on Saturdays. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>